This reader interview is sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. So today we have Aaron Raisey from, uh, you're in New Zealand, what city? Napier. Napier. Yep, it's on the, uh, there's two main islands, it's in New Zealand, the North Island, the South Island, uh, Napier is in the North Island on the East Coast, about halfway down on the East Coast. And Aaron, you have a Instagram, what do they call it, uh, whatever, that, that I follow, and you post a lot of Gene Wolfe books. You have some great ones. Yes, yeah, yeah. I um, unfortunately I haven't posted for a little while, but uh, I thought, well, it would be nice just to work my way my way through the collection. I've been collecting books in general, I guess, for about oh, 15, 16 years now. I started off with uh, Gnome Press. I thought, oh, here's a, here's a good job for me. I enjoy books, so I'll collect some of the classics. So I started off with the goal of collecting the whole Gnome Press catalogue, and I'm almost there. And um, I thought, well, Gene Wolfe, he's my favourite author. And why not start collecting him? So I set the task of collecting everything of his in signed first editions, where at all possible. Ah, oh, I am so envious. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. My, my sights aren't set quite that high. I am looking to collect everything he's written. So you know, the uncollected stuff, and you know, my and my wife uh, actually does most of the collecting for me. I'll come to the mail and oh look, she got me a book. Yeah, yeah. You know, quali- we're looking, we're looking for quality, but we're also, but she's also looking for a, a price that kind of makes sense when I fill up my library. So yeah, that's that's got to be really hard. yeah. That's the yeah right. What what I think you're about to say is because he's passed away, and which I noticed because I keep an eye on all the pricing of the books and that since he passed away, everything's gone up. Uh, in price and also you're in new zealand so that's probably an imposition right there yeah actually the majority of my uh, books i collected while i was in korea uh, but anyway i have a good friend in the states and he acts like a sort of a way station or a clearinghouse for me where everything i buy on ebay which is based in the states which is by far the most of it i get sent to him he sits there and collects them for me for about six months and then ships them in, in one hit to uh, over here to me in New Zealand, so that reduces the uh, the shipping cost quite considerably, actually. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. Let me pull up my questions because for some reason I can never remember them. The the questions are just a guide, you know. If anything comes to your mind. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's been really good, actually. The it's nice to hear, you know, the opinions and the feelings of uh, sort of the casual reader rather than the, you know, with the podcasts, and that have been really excellent because it's made my appreciation of Gene Wolfe just increase dramatically. But um, listening to the, sort of the everyday person, and you, you realize, well, hey, the, everyone has the same problems with, uh, well, the pro- problems is probably the wrong word, but, you know, <laughs> everyone has the same challenges uh, when reading and appreciating Gene Wolfe, you know, you're not the Lone Ranger kind of thing. Yeah, and, and you know, Gene Wolfe felt the same way about readers. He didn't, he explicitly believed that, you know, famous reviewers and everything or writers don't have a special insight into the quality of a book or the meaning of a book. Yeah, that's right. Let's go ahead and do it. Uh, first encounter with a wolf story. This would be about 1983 or 84. There's a little bit of a background to this interesting to me, but um, I used to play D and D at, uh, at a friend's house. Oh, we used to you know, rotate around the different, uh, members of the party. I was the dungeon master, but uh, we used to rotate around the various members of the party. Go to their house on the Saturday afternoon and play D anD D. Anyway, one of the one of the one of our friends, his mother worked in a local bookstore here in Napier, and the bookstore you, you get sort of uh, advanced copies or sample copies that the staff you know take take a stack of home a stack of books home sorry to read. And anyway, so he used to have all these books at his house. Uh, quite often and occasionally we'd have a look through and and uh, grab anything that interested us for us to read ourselves so what attracted me you know I've always been a sci-fi fantasy reader ever since I was very young uh, you know started off with the, you know the Heinlein juveniles and and I don't know if you've ever heard of a, an English author called Hugh Walters I don't yeah not that not the top of my head 
What did he write? What did he write? Oh, he wrote uh, sort of adventure, space adventure stories based on it. There was a, I forget the name of the um, the organization that was based on Earth, but it was a, within the solar system. But they had, they had these incredibly cool titles like Mission to Mars and, and Spaceship to Saturn and Passage to Pluto, you know, very alliterative. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, they had uh, great um, cover art by uh, uh, Leslie Wood. Uh, very classic 70s, you know, 60s and 70s stuff. And I really enjoyed those. But in any case, uh, you know, a cover is a, a great part of the package when you're young and looking for stuff to read. Sure. And uh, what struck me was the uh, these were the Arrow paperbacks. They came out about 19... Oh, my. They came about 82. Yes. The, the, with the, pen, the Pennington covers, yeah. right? <laughs> and so Shadow of the Torture, the names the names are sell immediately to a 14 or 15-year-old, you know, and the, the Pennington cover out to that uh, those editions, uh, which I think were on the, the UK first editions, the hardcover first editions also. So that's where they were taken from. But anyway, the, the Pennington cover out was just su- – Superb, and I still think that's the best cover for. That's just my personal opinion. Of course, the best cover for that Shadow of the mm-hmm. Torture for the New Sun series is the Pennington stuff. So it kind of, for me, that kind of fits in with the the sort of mysterious, unusual atmosphere that that Gene Wolfe builds in those books. So, but anyway, that was my first encounter. I think he had Shadow and the Claw, or rather Shadow. Of the the torture and the claw of the conciliator, and um, I had to pick up the other two myself a little bit further on down the track. But that was my first encounter with the wolf story. <laughs> and um, what really struck me, like it was very, very different from other stuff that I'd been reading. You know, the sort of the classic fantasy and your classic sci-fi. You know, like Heinlein and sure, that sort yeah. of stuff. But um, so it was. It was. How can I describe it? I guess it's a feeling that that a lot of readers have is that it's you're it's almost like you're you're not involved you're sort of stepped back this is just how I felt at the time it was very unusual and I felt like I was outside of the adventure or if we put it that way outside of the adventure looking into something uh that and I didn't have any kind of uh, emotional connection, very detached. I had a very detached viewpoint on the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And the way Gene Wolfe writes, yeah, I didn't know this at the time, but uh, subsequently discovered after reading lots of his stuff, he kind of has that, you have that detached feel mm-hmm. from, uh, you know, the sort of emotional or the action. One of the things that struck me, if I just sort of take an example from, I think it's Clora the Conciliator, is when he rides into Vodalus's camp on the back of the that uh, big beast, and he but look at there, yeah, yes. right, and he cuts the head off the 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 guard, and he sort of rides in, and like this is a high action kind of scene, <laughs> right? You know, a high <laughs> right. drama, high action kind of scene. He rides into the camp of this famous guy that he's been searching for, and he's then he's cut the head off. There's all this action going on, but the way he described it, it's like it was just matter of fact. It was like. Oh, that's, okay, so this this thing happened, you know. It's like, <laughs> wow, this is a, uh, you know, it's re- this is really badass, you know, right? And that really struck me as very different, and uh, I really enjoy that. I guess it fits with my personality, maybe a little bit sort of laid back, and but anyway, uh, that really struck me, and that's one of the things I really appreciate about the way he writes is that you can kind of put your own. He doesn't front load everything with all the motion and drama that you kind of expect from sci-fi and uh, fantasy. Mm-hmm. He gives you the space to put your own uh, sort of spin or feeling or view or uh, viewpoint, whatever it is. You know, you can fully invest your own attitude in there, uh, and he's not pushing what he thinks you should, how how you should be reacting to it. Um, if I might, I, I don't know if that's a, a coherent way of explaining it. No, no, no. And every time you read it, you get a different emotional take on it. Yeah. Because they, they transform. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time you read it, the more you know. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, that's just a, a, a microcosm of, you know, an overarch. If you look at the whole story, um, another one that really stood out to me was another, Is it? I can't remember if it's in um, the Sword of the Lictor or the Citadel. I think it's Sword where uh, young Severia falls, or he touches the ring on the big sculpture of, typhon right and he explodes and 
or he disappears in a arc of electricity or, or you know however he uh, gets himself terminated <laughs> and uh you know it was like you know there was a real tragedy for me but it's not really described that way in the page it's just like this this stuff happened you know right um but in any case yeah so great covers great title that got me hooked right from the very beginning um back then i was i just did surf i this is the way i still read gene wolf if i'm reading one for, uh, for the first time, not that there's any left for me to read for the first time, but it, I just read it surface. And I, I, you know, back then when I was younger, I didn't really know any other way. And it was just a, just a surface reading of the adventure. And it was like, well, I, you know, this, what's going on here? It's just like some story with, it's just a meandering thing. This guy's going around and sort of going from one place to another and collecting all these characters and discarding these characters along the way. I'm not sure. I don't really understand this, uh, but man, I love it. Yeah, and that's that's what got me hooked. So, well, it's it's interesting to me when I when I hear about people who picked up Wolf, the Book of the New Sun, or any of his stories so early, it's so young that that they would take to this style that is, as you say, so far removed. He his characters tend to be in some way removed from the story that they're telling even though the story may have happened to them it's all secondhand or there's latro who doesn't remember anything from yesterday and he reads all of this stuff it like it was written by someone else every time yeah yeah so <laughs> great uh, you know you know i tell my friend i've got this unbelievably cool story here and i tell my friends let this read this because we'll you know in, in your peer group you're reading the same sorts of things and sharing books and stuff right and man read this and it's like but i get friends that read it and they go oh it was <laughs> it was okay you know it was, it was pretty good but I, I'm, and I, i'm left dumbfounded that how you know why don't you like this more you know what, what's wrong with you right right and uh yeah yeah there's there's a particular reader out there that, that's us that that is um susceptible to this particular yeah. type of storytelling and yeah there's a lot of people out there who just don't get it oh well it's always uh, more time to uh more time for more people to get it my you know but uh yeah so that was uh first encounter and and it changed changed my it changed I think it's just it's it's affected me personally, you know, it's just the way I view things. And in what way? I, look, I I I don't know that the whole detached thing mm -hmm. and describing things in a way that you know a sort of matter of fact and leaving people to make up their own minds about rather than pushing a narrative on somebody or um, you know not pushing a narrative too hard on on people, letting people fill in their own blanks uh, or, you know, if, you know, the blanks that are there, letting them fill their own, fill them in for themselves. It's a bit, a bit hard to say, but I just feel that the, that, that yeah, that re reading him changed me in some small way personally. I, I think, uh, hopefully I'm all the better for it. So. No, I get it. I get it. <laughs> sure. Sure. I, well, I remember talking to Jack Dan and him and, talking about, you know, the, the the Island of Dr. Death and other stories and saying how, you know, there are some stories you read and it just changes your brain. And yeah, I mean, I have to kind of reset all my expectations when I'm reading something else uh, that's not Wolf because I know, okay, they're, they're just telling a story. This is in some sense, maybe a, a treatment for a, a movie or a television show where you're just kind of looking through a lens and it's not this is not a story from the future. This is just another story about the future. Whereas, you know, with Wolf, it's from, it, you feel like it's from someplace else. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, favorite novel or short story, either or both. Uh, this, the, my favorite novel. Well, obviously we have to, we, I, I have to explain myself that new sun is not it. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it, it's obviously his greatest, his greatest work. I have no no doubt about that, and that's for sure. And it's uh, certainly a great work of uh, literature, full stop. But as great as as it is, it's really tough. Mm -hmm. It's a real hard go. Um, 
I really enjoy Long Sun. That's I think his best work is the Long Sun. It's really mm. really tight. It's got everything in there. It's uh, it's really uh, yeah really. I think it's his best well most well put together um, work. But for me, my favourite is the Wizard Knight. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's a great story. It's relatively easy to read. You know, a surface you can do a surface read on it as I do. Well, first pass anyway. You know, you just read it as a story, and it and it's still really good. You know, you're not left scratching your head. You know, it's got all the great Wolfian sort of mm-hmm. uh, tricks and and uh, all that stuff. There's there's a lot under the surface if you if you want to go there. Obviously. The cast of characters is great. I think it's probably the largest cast of sort of major or um, relevant characters of any wolf book. Um, so uh, that's really good. Yeah. I think, you know, I think that Wizard Knight is probably his most involved work of world building, other than maybe the book of the new sun it definitely competes with that the, the whole layered you know you get the, the sky up above and and um ale first down below and that kind of thing and how time right sort of is really slow at the bottom and speeds up and you know it's a really great i know he draws a lot from um mythologies around the world and 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 that to to build these things but uh, the whole conceit of of that and how it works is really really cool yeah, the other the other thing I really enjoy about Wolf's writing yes. in general, which is put to good use in in The Wizard Knight, is his use of um, vocal idiosyncrasies, bringing out vocal idiosyncrasies of the characters. The most, um, I guess, the most obvious example is from mm-hmm. Long Sun that most people would be very familiar with is uh, is a Patera Remora, I think, with his all his ums and ahs and all that kind of stuff. I always imagine him as William F. Buckley. Yeah, right. <laughs> And, you know, and that that he really does that so well on on the page. You know, giving those completely different voices, uh, vocal characteristics to to characters. And there's a lot of that in uh, the Wizard Knight, and I I think he does it best there. Uh, you know, over a, a whole range of different characters. Oh yeah, short story, short story. <laughs> yeah, no, th- this is a really. Uh, sort of simple one, but one one story of his that, that's always it wedged itself in my brain, and, and it's uh, for better or worse, it's one that I love, and it's called My Book, and that's it's in Endangered Species, and I think it's the only place that it, I don't think it was public, published anywhere else. I have read that one, but I can't remember what it's about. The main, the main conceit of it is you get to the end, and it's only about two pages, two and a half pages, something like that. And you get to the end and you realize the author's written the story beginning at the last, he's written it backwards, starting at the last word. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? So you yeah. get to the end and you, you realize you haven't been right, reading a, it's like a creative writing exercise of some some mm-hmm. kind. I imagine this is maybe, this is what it was for him. He just tossed it off as some sort of, sort of uh, creative writing exercise i guess but you get to the end and, and he's explaining how he how he wrote the story when when you get to the end that he wrote the last word first <laughs> and and it's like one of those mind-bending things you how how does this work you know it's like you know six cents you get to the end and everything is you know it's not it's just not a parallel kind of example it's just you know it just tosses the whole previous what you've just watched or what you've just read into a completely different light and you have to rethink everything about what you just read and how did you know how did he how did this happen you know so it's it's uh, quite a mind-bending thing for me i know it's not a major story or or anything like that it's just a very small thing but it's one that's always since the very first time i read it it's just stuck in my head and and uh, i just love it that is not something i've ever one i've ever heard of someone uh, remarking as being their favorite but it's very Wolfian, right? In that he loves the structure of story. He loves playing with yeah, the structure yeah, yeah. of a story and narrative. So, no, that's a good one. Well, all right then. Favorite wolf word? Favorite word from a wolf story? Uh, my favorite word is one that has to be in everyone's top three. 
<laughs> it's the uh, the color darker than black. Oh it's yes, Vulligen. Uh Okay, what's your second? Second, oh, Kakajin probably. Uh, Destri- like everything else comes second. <laughs> Vulligen's number one, and and all these other weird words that I uh, you just you read it and you think, okay, this means this. I don't. I've never seen it before. I've never heard of it before. I don't know where it comes from, uh, but it's really cool. And so uh, everything, all of those words come second. Fulgen, when I read, first time I read that, it's one of those ones that you read it and you it, you understand, I, I understand might be the wrong way to put it, but uh, it just fits and it works and it's like just totally natural. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. And he, he does this with lots of different words, right? But, but the Fulgen, uh really struck me as being something I'd never – heard before it also sort of te- i think it's it might be one of the first in the new sun it might be one of those words those kinds of words might be one of the very first ones or first notable ones so it kind of sets you up to in the mindset okay we're going to get you know you don't consciously think about this i guess but you, we're going to be getting these words that i have no idea what they are that are that i have to be sort of associating with with something you know what i mean yes no no i get it yeah and i think that word sort of sets you up for all the other ones that come you know you, you kind of okay i understand what's going on here even if i don't understand the word or what it is i understand what's going on you know yeah like like that beast what was the name of that beast we mentioned it earlier with or you mentioned it the belukathir belukathir yeah right right so so that's another one. That's another one. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's it sounds like some kind of dinosaur or ancient uh, one of those mega mammal things, that, right? So uh, yeah, it's it's the largest it's the largest land animal ever known to have lived. Oh, is that is that a, a true word? A proper word? Is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a rhinoceros without a horn, with long neck with like a it's like a rhinoceros giraffe with no horn yeah it's it was 25 feet tall and like uh, i think 20 tons yeah that's pretty sizable (laughs) certainly something impressive to ride into somebody's uh camp but uh yeah (laughs) while holding up the head while while holding up the head of the the guard is in an in an right with the, with the blood spurting out of yeah. his body while he's driving yeah. it in. Yeah, extremely badass. Yeah, that, that's all. That, that's that's got to be the most cinematic scene in the book. But anyway, right. the, the 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 yeah, the point is, you, you you kind of you know, it's these are not they're not words that are totally misplaced. And it's like like some authors, you know, they just make something up, and you can say, oh, that right. you know, it's a made up. That's a made up word. You, you get a sort of a sense for the for these things as you read more and more of, uh, you know, you get a sense for like, that's just a made up word or, but Wolf has meanings and, you know, sort of reality. He draws on reality for all these words. And that comes through, even if you don't know the word, right. you, you know that, uh, yeah, this is based in something. This is, could be a thing. It's based in something real. It feels, sounds real. Right. It feels real, you know? Well, yeah. When, but of course what I came upon, well, if I was in my 30s, early early 30s, and I've always kind of had this personality, I can't just pass over a word that looks like a real word and not figure out the answer, find the definition to it, even if I kind of know what it is, but I still have to know the exact meaning of it. Yeah. And so I, I'm interested coming upon these words when you're 14 years old. Did you just, oh, I'm just going to treat it like science fiction words. Yeah. Yeah. The- yeah, pretty much. Although, as I as I said, their 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 wolf somehow manages to convey a, a reality and uh, a sense of properness or correctness for the word and the in the context he puts it in. So it's not as I said, it's not just a made up word. It feels right, and and at that age, I was just taking that in and thinking, okay, yeah, that that, that seems right to me. I'll just okay. <laughs> put that aside. And, you know, you're getting all these kinds of words coming at you throughout the whole the whole book. And uh, it's it lends, uh, I don't know, you know, his world building is second to none. You know, it's just all part of sure. it. Sure. Yeah, definitely. So how about a personal non-consensus theory about a wolf story or your favorite one? Um, this is a bit tough. I I don't read 
the forums or mm -hmm. um, I've only recently over the past year or so been getting into the wolf podcasts and that's been a that's been a huge sort of uh, revelation for me it's like you know I'm I'm here in New Zealand by myself reading <laughs> Gene Wolf, or actually, if you put you put yourself anywhere reading Gene Wolf, you're a lone ranger, right? Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're on your own, and the the, the next person that reads and appreciates Gene Wolf in a similar way to you, they always seem so far away, somewhere out there, and and what the especially you know the podcast especially have brought in is that there are lots of other people out there that appreciate this and, and have a view that's different maybe different than yours or similar or but a lot of really real l sort of literature uh, uh commentary that is you know it's more or less beyond me but um but that really that's really good so i haven't been plugged into that uh, at all really only the podcast for the past year or so but in um in uh, Fifth Head and uh, the Short Sun that uh, St. Anne and St. Croix are blue and green. I don't know if this has had any traction or controversy in the circles that criticise these things. Right, the other thing across my mind is moon and earth, of course, the blue is earth and the green is the moon, because we get that reference in, in the, the new sun, the, the moon is green. But anyway, get, getting back to the fifth head tie-in, you know, uh, the abos from fifth head and, and the inhumi from, from uh, short sun, they seem to me to be the same thing. They have sort of a shape chain ability. They're ostensibly native to these worlds somehow. They mimic and feed on the, mm -hmm. the, the people that arrive there. So I just thought, I just drew, drew those parallels. I thought, hey, they're going to be the same thing. I think those. Yeah, I think you're one hundred percent. I think you are picking up on something that's real there. I definitely believe that he's re-examining that relationship in a different way. In fact, yeah. When you think about it, you know, uh, Saint Gua and and Blue are both screwed up. The people there are screwed up in very similar ways. Yeah, and if you if you remember in Fifth Head. I can't remember whether Saint Anne or Saint Croix has the the city he's in is a port city, and there seems to be a lot of different boats and and stuff. So mm -hmm. you know that might tie in with with blue. Look, I don't know, I'm just I'm just picking things out that seem similar, but the 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 abos and the inhumi parallel just seems to be yeah. too to me. It just seemed to be too perfect. Yeah, it's it, how could it not be? Yeah, I definitely see that. All right. Well, how about most frustrating mystery to you in a wolf story? Uh, the land across. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the land across. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone's favorite Gene Wolf doorstop. Um, no, no. I I really enjoy it. Uh, I don't know why. I, it's again, it's Wolf's writing. I have no, I have no clue what's going on, and mm -hmm. I feel like. When I read New Sun for the first time, it's just like I have no idea what's going on. I'm just reading this. It's a really cool book. I, I really like it. You know the 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 story. You know I don't know what's going on with the story, but there's the prose. You know Gene Wolf's Gene Wolf's writing. I just love it. it doesn't matter that it doesn't make any sense to me. It kind of does because you. I still don't know what's going on, really, but <laughs> it's just so so great to uh, great to read. Yeah, you, you know that's the, the reaction I had with Interlibrary Loan is that I have no. It's probably the first time that I would that I read a, one of his books, and didn't understand it, and wasn't totally frustrated, but could really appreciate the fact this is the best prose he's done in years. Yeah, no, I feel the same. Interlibrary Loan is very similar, which is, uh, but, but you know, Borrowed Man, the the precursor to to that was, uh, you know, I think that was a fantastic book. The world building that's uh, really great, and mm -hmm. um, definitely, and uh, that's really good. But to, the Interlibrary Loan, it's like, oh, I'm not sure. yeah. <laughs> there's there's obviously, uh, you know, with the the parallel or the 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 star gates or whatever it is that he's leaping to different worlds. It seems like there's some bigger thing going on there that he probably never got to conclude somehow with subsequent books. Yeah, yeah, right. But uh, so interlibrary loan. Do you have any theories about interlibrary loan? No, no, I don't. 
<laughs> I was talking to Craig just uh, the other day about Wolf's papers that were donated to uh, a, a university in Illinois, and they haven't been categorized yet. So I don't know whether anybody could look at. Them. Craig, he lives in nearby, actually, not in that state, but on the border, and he was thinking of going by and and just seeing if he could get them to let him take a look at some of them, and uh, you know, every, you know, of course. He's interested in, but you know what? Maybe there's some sort of early drafts of the Book of the New Sun, or you know, whatever. He was, he mentioned it to Mark Aramini, and he says, I, "Well, I want to know if there's anything about Land Across." <laughs> oh, yeah, I uh, listened to it the past couple of times in audio form. You know, I don't know why. <laughs> I, you know, I like, I like, I like the book. I like the 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 idea. Um, what should we say? Uh, you know, going to a, a different, you know, this mysterious sort of country and all these things happen to him and, and there's some kind of uh, supernatural thing going on at the same time. And, and uh, it's uh, really, really great. I really enjoy it, but God knows what the hell's going on. So as, as you get older reading, you know, as I said before, I, I like to surface read first time, but God, it's so hard when, you know, you've been reading Wolf for a while and you understand what, you know, how he kind of works with, with his books and how many layers there are in there and all the connections and meanings. And it's really, it get, becomes really difficult to do a, just a, just a flat, enjoyable read, you know, because you're always second guessing things and oh, what, 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 I, I must remember that, that might be, that seems important or something happens later and you think back and you think, oh, it, what was the connection? You know, it's it's um, it's a little bit frustrating. Or what the heck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember reading a borrowed man, and when he first goes into that jungle room, and he he goes in the jungle room through the through the window, and then he goes out the door, and then he he shuts it, and then later they go through all of these steps for how you can't really get out in and out of the room without the book. And it's a key. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> he just walked through the jungle room and left on that. And so, yeah, I'm always, I'm always second guessing everything. I can't, I can't turn my brain off, which is why my first read of a, a wolf novel or story is always my least favorite because I don't, I, I don't have the information, but I can't stop asking. Mm, right. Oh, fun fact. The book, the book that's required to get through the gate is called Murder on Mars. Mm -hmm. Hugh Walters, uh, the English author I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, one of his later novels is called Murder on Mars. Really? Yeah, sitting on my bookshelf as, as I speak. Oh, I like that. I, I'm going to look that one up. That That is, thank you for that. That's good. There, there, there might be, I haven't gone back to Murder on Mars to, uh, to reread it, but maybe there's something in there that, it's a, it's a murder mystery, murder mystery on Mars, but um, there might be something in there that might be irrelevant. Uh, who knows? Uh, Hugh Walters. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I had already tucked it away, but I checked that guy out. But now, maybe I have to. Murder on Mars. Let's see. Another another Wolfian red herring to chase down. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I probably have a shelf full of books that I ended up picking up and reading simply because I said, I wonder if there's a wolf connection in there. Let's see. I'm going to read the plot summary. A crater on Mars, in a crater on Mars, an engineer from Mars base has been found dead. His spacesuit slashed. Despite having a large number of suspects to interview, Maury Kant, Sergei uh, Sm Smyslov, and Tony Hale's questioning flushes out a prime suspect, but Tony does not believe they have the right man and hatches a dangerous plan to, to find the real killer. Well, it's not obvious, but it could still be there. That's pretty cool. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. It's been uh, been a pleasure. And these, I might have mentioned it before, the, these reader interviews you're doing are, are really uh, you know, they're really, really cool to listen to ordinary people. Yeah. Oh, I could listen to stuff like this all day long. <laughs> this is, I'm doing the podcast that I wanted to hear. Yeah. yeah. So thank, thank you guys very, very much for that, and and keep up the good. Oh, I appreciate the good it. work. All, all the analysis on Wolf. I, I'm, 
sure I speak for so many people out there when I say we've been dying for something like this for so long, so long. Oh yeah, we're just a couple of giddy fanboys, really. That's um, but we're not the only ones. <laughs> This was sponsored entirely by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash rereadingwolf to play a part in bringing other amazing things like this into the world. And if you want to take on the five questions with us, reach out by email or by one of the other methods listed in the show notes to this episode.